Okay. Well, then I am going to go ahead and turn the time over to Kenneth to get going on our class tonight. Thanks for coming, Kenneth. Well, I've got some questions that I'm interested to see a raise of hands. So could I have you flip on your camera for just a sec? So I'm interested to see how many of you in your relationships have had fights about the same thing multiple times? Okay, unanimous, all right, good. Uh, how many have had problems that have not gone away since the beginning of the relationship? Okay, good. <laughs> and how many of you have things that you're kind of afraid to talk about? Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about what's behind all that, why the problems stick around. And um, we're gonna talk about what to do about it. Anybody remember back in April, the Suez Canal got blocked by that ship. It was called the Ever Given, that was the name of the ship. And it was 1,500 feet long, which I can't really comprehend but it's almost as long as the Empire State Building is tall. Now, the Suez Canal is one of the busiest waterways in the world. It accounts for 30% of global container shipping traffic every day. And when the Ever Given hit a storm, a dust storm came up, there were winds blowing 40 miles an hour, and the ship went off course, and we don't know what happened, but the thing ran aground and blocked the whole canal diagonally. More than 400 ships were left just waiting at the other end of the canal, trying to get through. Now, 12% of global trade passes through there usually. And um, they were like, okay, we, this is obviously costing us like a lot of money. We need to get this thing out. So they bought it, brought in tugboats and they got in dredging vessels that could like pull up dirt, move the mud and the sand, they cleared out 1.1 million cubic feet of mud and sand from there. It would be like standing on a, in a football field and the whole thing is full, 19 feet tall. So it would basically be like drowning a giraffe, like its horns might be poking up out of that. So that's a lot of work. It took a lot of time. The ship itself was, it had, could hold 20,000 containers. And there were uh, 1,800, 18,300 containers on board, right? So this, this ship is huge. There's so much going through there. It's such an important waterway. And this one ship blocked everything. There's uh, in one day, $9.6 billion moving through that canal. So it's huge. And it was costing the, the Suez Canal Authority, I think like 9 million a day or something. So all of the progress, all of the trade, all of the movement of those other ships came to a halt because of one obstruction. And as long as the ship was stuck, so was everything else. And even, you know, things not related to the ship. There are plenty of other ships owned by different companies, ships from other countries, had nothing to do with this ever given ship. And yet they were held up because of it. And in the same way, there's a lot of parts that go into making a relationship work. And if we have the one thing that we're gonna talk about today on the, the field, it's gonna make everything else kind of get blocked up and will not flow smoothly. This one big thing that is one of the biggest problems we have, it causes communication issues. And behind almost every fight, this is lurking. Tonight, we are talking about shame. One of my favorite topics, shame, is what crashes the ship that puts marital bliss on hold. But before we go any further, I need you to do two things for me. I wanna make sure that you have a notebook laying around or you have a Word document open on your computer, something that you can take notes on. Because tonight you're going to hear things and they're going to resonate with you. And it may not be so much what I'm saying, you're going to have like a little thought pop into your head and go, huh, 
feel like I just got 1% smarter. That was interesting. I think I need to know this. And whatever truths are going to resonate with you, those are the ones that you need to hear. I'm going to say a lot of words tonight, and not all of them are super important. But there's going to be something that just sparks something in you. And that's your gut, your true sense telling you, oh, this is the next thing that I need to work on. So that's the first thing I need you to do. Second thing, I need you to indulge me again and flip on your camera for a second, because we are all going to wave to Wendy, thank her for setting this class up and making it possible for us to be here tonight. So gratitude waves for Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks. Tonight, um, Decided like we can just do questions and answers all the way through. If you have anything, you can put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Um, so I'll feel free to hop in anytime. Tonight, I'm excited to talk about shame because shame is one of my biggest nemeses. I hate shame. Shame is something that kept me miserable for many years. When I was a teenager, I don't know, middle school is always rough for everybody, it seems. And when I was 14 and a half, we moved from overseas in a private school where it was not the worst middle school experience. It had its challenges, but it was a lot better than many people's in the States. So I took this um, decent environment, and then I came into the public school system in Ogden. And it was a struggle. I didn't have any friends. We, we moved in with my grandparents because we didn't have a house and we moved back from a pretty good situation because my grandma had cancer. So we are in a house built in the 1940s with my grandparents living there, my uncle, and then the six people in our family. It was just kind of a miserable time and 14 is an awkward age. And that's really where I started to be full of shame, this, this self-loathing. And I really did not like myself. And, and this grew inside of me, this darkness grew until I felt pretty depressed, pretty miserable. I did not like who I was. And I felt like I was defective and I should be punished for it. I was really mean to myself. I had a lot of really negative thoughts that I would let go through my head and I would say negative things to myself and about myself. And I'd make myself the butt of a joke, try to cover it up. I was fighting a hard struggle and I felt like I was in this cave, like I had banished myself to this cave because I didn't feel like I was worthy of the light. And I planted these this tree where the roots grew down over me and held me against this wall so that I couldn't really get out, I couldn't escape. And sometimes I would fight against it and like try to reach out into the light and I'd alternate constantly back and forth between feeling like, I hate this, I want to get out, and like, no, I just deserve to be here. Being kind of powerless to escape. I hope when, when you see teenagers acting sullen or angry or kind of crazy, you'll remember that they're fighting a hard battle and they're coming to a level of self-awareness they've never had and they're recognizing the things in themselves they don't like. And I hope you'll extend to them a little compassion. And I hope too, that you will recognize what we're gonna talk about tonight in yourself, even though it's kind of uncomfortable, usually, honestly. I'm kind of gonna be pulling back the curtain and pointing to the wizard back there who's trying to hide. Some of you are gonna you pretend like you don't have shame. Some of you work very hard to cover it up and that's normal, but I wanna tell you that every single human on this planet struggles with shame and it's okay and it's okay to admit it and it's okay to share it and, and show it. We need to talk about it because shame functions in the darkness. And when we don't talk about it, it grows. It's like moldy leftovers in the back of the fridge. Shame is one of the driving forces behind depression, behind anxiety, behind suicide. It's also one of the biggest reasons we can't get anything done in Washington, DC. It has to do with shame and how we react to our shame. It causes marriages to fall apart. It makes people feel lonely. It's basically connected to everything that sucks. And that's why I hate it so bad. So what is shame? Well, it has to do with usually our abilities 
or our relationships. And it's a feeling of worthlessness. It can be a feeling of self-loathing. So if it pertains to our abilities, we usually feel like, oh, I'm not good enough. Am I good enough to get this job? Am I good enough to pass this test? When it comes to relationships, the thought is often like, am I a good person? Am I likable? Do people like me? Am I worthy of love? But underlying whichever one we have more of, and usually we have a mixture, there's this feeling of like, I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. And so since we have this, and it's a terrifying feeling of not being good enough, we don't want to face it. And so we usually do three things to try to manage it. And you can basically hide it, spread it everywhere, or try to distract from it. The spreaders, these are the people that become me monsters. You know, the people where they just dominate a conversation and they don't show any interest in you. And it's like they're in their own little world and nothing you say can really get through. That's because <laughs> they're so caught up in their own stuff. That they don't have any room to think about anywhere else. They're not aware of the needs of others. They trap you and emotionally vomit all over you without your consent. They can be needy and kind of suffocating. Um, I was one of these. <laughs> I had a blog back in the day when people did blogs. I kind of knew that I had this tendency to like vomit all over people. And I named the blog Indiscriminate Emotional Whoring. Just to be like a little like self-aware, like I know what I'm doing here by like bearing on my feelings. You can also deal with it by distracting yourself from it. This is where we kind of have a big ego and we try to look like we're too cool. Like nothing touches me. I'm fine. I don't have feelings. I don't have to worry about vulnerability. That's not my thing. People with uh, in the distractor category often can be kind of emotionless. If we're talking about the whole fighter fight, fight paradigm, they're usually the fighters. They're like, what, what, I'm fine. Oh, the guys who peacock and, and try to look tough and, and wear the shirts that are really too tight and always walk around like looking for a fight, they're the distractors. And the ones who kind of shrink away from it, they're the ones who are like, okay, I have this, I hate it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want people to know about it. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm going to kind of like be small, be a wallflower, avoid notice. When there's conflict, they usually, it's flee. It's all about flight. They're going to run away from it and clam up and have a hard time talking. These are usually the ways we deal with it, right? But everybody's got it and everybody compensates for it in some way. If we feel like we're not good enough. We try to make up for it by like achieving great things or caring for other people and being selfless. Maybe we want to have like tons of knowledge, build a strong support network around us to like help us. We want to stand out and, and be like recognized for being different or edgy <laughs> or we try to be perfect. There's lots of different ways and we all try to compensate. And so much of our personality comes from how we're trying to medicate and manage our feelings of shame. But the problem is when shame's there, even though, you know, when you try to compensate for shame by being perfect, you, you can do a lot of good things. You can do a lot of good in the world. When you try to compensate by like trying to achieve stuff, you can go do amazing things. There are people who are CEOs because they feel like they're inadequate and they need to do something great that other people will finally recognize and say, you have earned the goodness here. Here's self-esteem. Have this. You have worth now. And it's just a ladder to nowhere. And it leads to us just being fake with each other. We put on the mask. We put on a persona. We can be prideful. We don't treat each other well because of it. But it makes us live in fear. And then we don't feel free. We don't feel personally free. We hold back who we are. We don't speak up for ourselves. We don't share our opinions. We don't rock the boat, even when we probably need to. We struggle with conflict, either by like not saying enough or being too aggressive. We struggle to find assertiveness when there's shame involved. We're not taking the risks that we need to. And it blocks us in our communication. We end up living in a world where we're not really interacting with each other. We're just interacting with each other's masks. We're exchanging social pleasantries, but we're never talking about the deep stuff that really matters. One of the problems with shame is it holds the truth hostage because there are some truths we don't want to face and some things that we think are true that are actually lies, like I'm not good enough. And when we 
refuse to talk about these things or even acknowledge they exist, we're going to try to cover up our actions. People will come to us and say, hey, this is a problem. And we're going to go, no, it's not, whatever, forget it. You know, like, get used to it. And then the truth is held hostage, and then things don't change. So everybody has this, and it just comes from the fact that we live in an imperfect world where we're not perfect and omniscient and powerful. Like, we can die, we are vulnerable. It doesn't really matter necessarily too much of where shame comes from, but it does matter that we recognize that shame is a lie. We aren't worthless. But Kenneth, wait a minute. Isn't shame kind of correct? Like, we can be kind of unlovable and we are incapable of a lot of things. Yeah, it's true. We have our limitations. But the lie comes in where we start basing our worth on that. Like, well, be, I'm not lovable enough. I'm not nice enough. I'm not selfless enough. I'm not competent enough. Therefore, I suck. Therefore, I am worthless. I should loathe myself. And we get caught in this vicious, vicious cycle where we're like, okay, I'm not enough. I need to make sure I punish myself. And then, then I'll do better. Then I can move forward in life. It's like we are all runners and we're, we're running around the track and we're looking at our time. We're going, I'm not fast enough. Man. And we stop, we sit down, we start punching ourselves in the legs. And then we go, you are not fast enough. You're not good enough. Two things are happening. One, we've stopped our forward progress. Sit down and beat ourselves up. Two, we've injured ourselves. And so now when we get back up to run, we're trying to do so with bruises, broken bones. We're not gonna go as fast. It's so destructive and it holds us back. And if you've ever felt stagnant, I can almost guarantee shame's behind it. And when I talk about how defective like this idea is, that we're defective, when I talk about this doesn't work, people are like, but wait a minute, if I don't punish myself, how will I progress in life? I'll, I won't, I'll lose all my motivation and I'll be totally lazy. It's like, we think if we're not there constantly whipping ourselves, we're not gonna move. Like, is that really who we are though? That we need to be whipped constantly to move around the track? It can certainly seem like it, especially when we haven't really experienced anything differently. But I can tell you from personal experience that once we get rid of the punishment aspect, we feel this freedom where we're like, well, I can breathe. And we find this sense of well-being and centered calm and confidence. And then we go, huh, what should I do with myself? Maybe I should achieve things. When we start to take care of our basic human needs, we naturally want to progress. We naturally want to move forward. It's just how we're wired. If you know somebody, that seems kind of stuck and they're not moving forward. It's just because shame is blocking them. It's not because they're a lazy person and you are not a lazy person. We don't have lazy people. We have people whose needs aren't being met. When you take care of the needs, then you just want to move forward. Getting rid of shame will be the best thing as far as motivation goes and as far as having ambitious ambitions. But if you don't like who you are, not a lot else really matters to you, you know? We feel miserable and we're just trying to medicate that constantly and distract ourselves from it. And then we get stuck into addictive behaviors all because we're running from this shame. So we're not as lovable as we could be. We're not as capable as we could be. Even if shame was, is totally correct, fine. Well, let's, say that, let's say that it is true. What are we gonna do about it? Sit there and feel miserable? Beat ourselves up so we don't progress? It's all completely pointless. Even if it was true, we need to do something about it. And here's where we we can enter a new idea, a new concept into the whole construct of shame. And this can be hard to grasp, but shame says you're worthless, punish yourself. But guilt says you made a mistake, you didn't measure up, and do something about it. Punish yourself versus do something about it. Punishment versus responsibility. Guilt motivates us to responsibility. I screwed up. I need to fix this versus 
Oh no, I'm horrible. I should just sit here and beat myself up. Think about it. We, like, we have the largest prison system in the world. When people come out of prison, are they totally reformed? Are they <laughs> walking out like, I'm ready to contribute to society now. I'm cured. No, there's a terrible recidivism rate. Punishment doesn't do much to change behavior. Punishment is one of the lowest forms of motivation. It can work in the short term, but not in the long term. And when we try to live our lives in punishment mode, we are stale and stagnant and held back. And people around us that we punish, same thing. If you're having problems with your kids, then let's move past punishment. There needs to be consequences for sure. But anything that's shame-based is just the lowest quality. We look at the military. They're like, got to break them down so you can build them up again. On their maggots and scream in their face and dehumanize them. Makes for a pretty lean fighting force. Yeah, also causes PTSD and a whole lot of shame issues. And then you have a huge suicide problem. We've got the evidence in front of us that shame doesn't work. And yet we just instinctively want to cling to it. So can everyone agree shame is stupid? Can we all just agree that it's not going to work? Let's, I'd like, I'd like to say this together. I'm going to throw this up on the screen here. We need to practice fighting the shame. And so we have a little declaration here that we can say together. Here we go. I want everybody to unmute themselves and prepare for declarations. This isn't letting me cut and paste. And now my screen's out. Wendy, are you, oh, there it is. Yeah, I was going to say, it showed up. It's just flashing on up. Okay. Everyone, join with me, please, if you'll unmute yourselves for a moment. Let's all put our hand yeah. over our sternum. Sternum. Clavicles, ribs. And let's say this together. I may, I not, may not be, be very, very capable, capable or, or lovable, but I'm, I'm still enough. enough. My, my worth has nothing to do with, with my performance. performance. People, People still, still like, me, like me, even though I'm, I'm flawed. flawed. How's that feel? That's nice, right? It's okay to accept. We're not perfect. We're all kind of messed up. We're all kind of stupid sometimes. That's all right. Literally everyone is. We need to remind ourselves of this more often. Can I make a quick comment about that, Kenneth? Sure, Wendy. So that's something that has, you know, always been hard for me. Um, but something that my therapist did for me years ago was talk to me for a while about my favorite people, my favorite aunt and uncle. Um, cause they, they had come up a lot and how much I love them and how supportive and loving and accepting they'd always been of me. Um, and then after having a conversation about that, then he said, are they perfect? Tell me about their flaws. Tell me about their, you know, and they clearly had some that I could even pull up and go, yeah, well, here are some of their flaws. And, and then he was like, does that change how much you love them, how you feel about them at all? And I was like, no, funnily enough, absolutely not. It doesn't change at all how I feel about them, um, which was a really helpful shift in my head um, because it was easy for me to love other flawed people with their flaws, but I had a hard time doing that same thing for myself. Um, but it was just nice to, um, to have that little light bulb go off and go, oh, there are really flawed people that I love so much and people do that for me too. I don't know, just thought I would throw that out there because that was a really helpful mm -hmm. way for me to bring you to think about it. Yeah, we need to just get over ourselves. Like, yeah, we're messed up, but so is everybody and we love them anyway, so they love us. And we're not the one special person in the entire universe that's exempt from this. Hard to accept the truth. So what role does shame play in relationships? Well, have you ever had a moment where you said something seemingly innocuous to your partner and all of a sudden they're angry and you're like, what 
is happening? Why? Is that, what is going on here? Probably Shane was underneath that most of the time. One of my friends was talking to me the other day. His anniversary is coming up. And they've been trying to figure out what they want to do. And his wife keeps coming to him and saying, what do you want to do for the anniversary? And he's like, well, uh, we could go for a trip. Uh, we could do this. We could do that. He's giving all these options. And nothing he says he likes. And she keeps coming back and saying, what are we going to do? And he's like, well, I must be telling her the wrong thing. And he's like, well, what do you want to do? And she goes, well, how about a couple's massage? And he says, does that sound good to you? And she's like, sounds good to me right now. And he starts to laugh a little bit because he's like, I didn't think you were too keen on getting a massage because I gave you that card for Mother's Day like three years ago and you still haven't used it. And I quote, he says, she goes, oh my gosh, just forget about it. Just forget it. Just forget about the whole thing. Forget it. I don't want to talk about that stupid disc card, the gift card, blah, blah, blah. I just thought you... Uh, he says to her, well, hang on a minute. I just, I, I'm just saying, I, I just thought you didn't want a massage because you've had the card for three years and you never, so that's all I'm saying. He's like, yeah, I don't want to hear about the gift card, okay? I'm, he's like, I'm, I'm literally just saying, he's like, don't get all pissed off, don't ruin our like anniversary weekend before it even starts. It's seemingly innocuous, right? Like, oh, you want a massage, but you didn't use the other card. And yet she got super upset and super angry. So what was going on there? What do you think she was thinking? Anybody want to chime in? I imagine she was embarrassed that she had that card for that long. I, I just threw about six coupons today that it all expired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there, yeah. Yeah, when you say when we're talking embarrassment, where that's usually going to be the road to shame. She's recognizing, oh, he's right. I haven't used it. And where's her mind going from there? It could be like he's making me feel stupid because he's pointing out this weakness of mine, or he's pointed out this thing that I've missed. And three years is a decent amount of time to be sitting on a gift card. Or maybe so she now, feels like he's trying to say she's ungrateful. Yeah. Could have been. Could have been. And um, the way this might be also related, and I'm not saying it is for sure, I don't know. But, you know, if we have this belief that we're unlovable, and he's bringing up the gift card, then um, he might be thinking, yeah, like, oh, he thinks I'm ungrateful, therefore he thinks I'm not good enough, or he thinks uh, I don't appreciate his gifts, and so I think I'm unlovable, and if he gives a gift and I kind of, like, don't use it and don't show that I value it, maybe he's going to leave me. There's usually a fear of abandonment down there at the bottom of shame if we feel like we're unlovable. That way, whenever we get into a fight, we're constantly worried that the person is going to leave us. We were like, oh, I'm not lovable. There's no reason they should be here. I tricked them, clearly. Like, I have somehow duped them into being with me. And at any moment, they're going to wake up and they're going to realize how terrible I am. This belief we have acts as a filter for all other beliefs. And it's going to make us focus on what other people think. It'll make us project what we think onto other people. Well, I'm not good enough, so therefore they don't think I'm good enough. And so if she's having this feeling of like, oh no, he's going to leave me. Yeah, you better believe she's gonna be upset in this moment. Whenever we're, um, whenever we're ashamed like that, like I said, we, we usually react one of three ways. and. She's more of a person that would like cover it up, covered up with some anger and she withdrew from the situation. So now how does she feel towards him? She's probably thinking he makes me feel stupid. Um, are they gonna talk about it now? Nope, that one's, that one's not something they're ever gonna really wanna like dig into again. 
are they getting closer as a couple or are they going to keep distance on this? He walks away from her thinking like, geez, what's wrong with her? She's nuts. She's touchy. She's overdramatic. And she walks away going, geez, what a stagnant jerk. And if things continue like that, and this becomes yet another thing they don't discuss, that causes stagnation in the marriage. They can't move forward. There's this list of things off limits that we just don't talk about. And the longer that list gets, the more there is between us. I was working with some clients the other night. And they came in and said, yeah, we had a fight over the weekend and the husband's talking. And he said, it was, it was, it was over something stupid. I don't even remember what it was about. And when he said that, I saw her eyes get bigger and she, she tensed up a little bit, looked at him and her foot started bouncing. And he, he didn't notice it because he was kind of in his own thing at the moment. But I was like, hey, what just happened with you? And she's like, I poured out my soul to you the other night and you don't remember what our fight was about? So she was getting the message like, I shared all of this deep stuff and put out my soul to you and you don't remember what it was about, then you must not care. And if you don't care about me in the relationship, uh oh, like I'm about to be abandoned and divorced, but also, oh no, proof that I'm not good enough. I'm not cut out for relationships and I never should have gotten married in the first place. So this thing escalated quickly. It kind of blew up because there's this pathway from wherever we are on the surface down to the root of shame going, you're not good enough. This isn't going to work. Why are you even in this relationship? And that causes us to put up walls because we're constantly walking around thinking, well, it's hopeless anyway. For some of us, when we're in this state, we think it's not going to work, but here I am. And it's just a matter of time till it falls apart. So why should I get close to them? Why should I be vulnerable? This is too, it's going to hurt too bad when it all ends. So I'm just going to put up a wall now. And then that wall acts as a barrier and they can't get close to us. They don't feel connected to us. And then they get hurt and they put up their wall. And, and now there's nothing getting through. And the love starts to wither and shrink and dissipate all because we're hiding behind these walls that we put up because we're afraid we're going to be abandoned because we're not good enough. Fear blocks the flow. And you're going to have your own process in your relationship, but it's probably going to be kind of similar. Are there any questions at this point? You want to take a second too to jot down any notes of anything that's kind of, ah, oh, okay, this is making sense. You want to ask yourself, um, what's the most recent example I've had where I've dealt with this? Shame's been a struggle. You know, when I hit my 20s, I finally started working on my shame. I, try, I tried to chop those roots up that were holding me in that cave. I fought my way out and started to build some self-love. But that doesn't mean it all goes away or that there aren't other areas where shame needs to be dealt with. When we got married, I was a brand new marriage and family therapy intern. And I think I had one client for like a month, one hour a week. And uh, my client load did not increase dramatically. It took a long time to even get close to full time. I still remember having a goal on my vision board of see 15 clients in one week. That was my big goal, like 15, big old 15. Maybe I can get to that someday. And this stretched on. We're in our second year of marriage, and I'm getting through my my internship and getting closer to the end. I still don't have the client load. And my wife is working full time as a massage therapist, and she's kind of bringing home the bacon, and I'm taking care of the household duties, and I'm feeling kind of inadequate, actually constantly inadequate. If I really thought about it, I have this stress on my mind of like, hey. When are you going to be the provider? But I also didn't feel like I could really do anything. I felt kind of powerless. And every time she brought up, hey, can we talk finances? 
I would just go into shutdown mode because that voice of like, you're not a provider, you're not a man, I would just sink and spiral into the depths. And it became one of those topics that we didn't really talk about very often because every time we did it, I would fall down into that pit. And I had all these concerns of like, should I get? she's just like, hey, maybe you could get a second job. And I'm thinking, I'm also trying to like kickstart my presenting career. And I need time to like work on my presentations and create videos. And if I'm working a second job, am I even gonna have time to do that? I mean, this is something that really matters. I don't know if I could do all three. And then there's also like, well, what about networking? You know, go talk to doctors and introduce yourself, give out your card so you can get some referrals. And I always struggled with that. I'm rubbish at networking because I'm like, I'm walking in to meet you to say, hello, I would like you to send clients so I can make money. And it just feels weird. Like I'm asking for something immoral or something. Like it's not natural to, hello, I'd like to meet you. And then you benefit me. Uh, it's a wall I kept running into. And so I felt absolutely inadequate to do that. And I'd go out sometimes and I'd have some successes and be like, hey, I'm just out forming like a genuine human connection with a person. Maybe there will be referrals for it. Cool. But like, it isn't about that, but it's, oh, it was so hard to reprogram that. And so sometimes I'd go and try and do the marketing and then I'd come back and I'd feel like too afraid to do anything else. And I would procrastinate and not do anything for months. And then the weight would build and build like you've ever done anything. You're not, you're not getting up your client load yet. And if you were good enough, you could. And so I just ignore it. I try to run from it till it went away. And Heidi felt more and more distant and more and more stressed because she couldn't talk to me. So here's the anatomy of how this would go. She'd bring it up and she's kind of clenching a little bit because it's stressful. She's between a rock and a hard place because we need to talk about finances, but she doesn't want to set me off. She knows I can't handle it. But she's bringing it up and then I'm like, oh no, and every muscle is clenching up in me. She sees me clenching up and then she clenches more and then she rushes to say everything probably more forcefully than she would need to because she feels afraid. And that tightens everything up and pushes it out. Then I feel like an unmanly loser and I sink into myself and I become quiet and she's sitting there trying to talk to a stone wall and she's upset and she's feeling alone. And now on top of that, she feels guilty because I am hurting. She feels like she did it. And now we don't wanna talk at all. And things are uncomfortable and there's a silence and we keep our distance from each other and things get worse in that regard and things stay the same. And they don't improve. That's how it went for us. You've probably got your own process, but probably something similar. So how do we shift then from shame to guilt? Because remember, shame equals you're worthless, you should be punished. Guilt equals, hey, you screwed up. Take responsibility, improve, right? Here's a step. I want you to write these down. Here's what we're going to do. When you start feeling shame, call it out. Help me, I feel shame. Oh no, I'm feeling shameful. I need you to help me. And then um, we change our story. Because the story for shame is you suck, you're not enough, and you start to shut down. But we don't want to go down that road. That story takes us down that road. We talked last time about how our stories influence everything in our personal life and in our relationship. So to conquer shame, we need to conquer the shame story in us. So I know it's autopilot, it hits us like a ton of bricks and we just ugh, have this lead weight in our soul that weighs us down. So when our brain starts telling us, and this may not be a voice in your head, this may just be a feeling of that heaviness, we know if we translate it into English, it's you're not enough, you're worthless, you're unlovable, you're, you're incapable. You should feel bad, you should beat yourself up. We replace it with the new story. Being inadequate, it isn't that bad. Being imperfect isn't a reason to feel bad about myself. It's a reason to work on change. In fact, we can uh, tell ourselves this story right here. I may not be very capable or lovable, but I'm still enough. My worth has nothing to do with my performance. 
people still like me, even though I'm flawed. I want you to all take a minute, write this one down. This can be your new mantra. This can be the thing that you say every morning when you wake up. When your eyes pop open, you go, that's a new day. Am I capable to meet all my challenges? Maybe not. We can work on it. I'm not super nice. Sometimes I'm kind of mean to people, but I'm working on it. And none of those things have anything to do with my worth. My worth is inherent in who I am, and it doesn't change, even when I screw up, even when I'm imperfect. And despite me being selfish sometimes, people still like me. And I'm working on people liking me more because I'm working on liking myself first. Does everyone have that written down? Okay. Um, there is a, a chat question asking how you help a partner who struggles with shame. So you said, if you are feeling shame, then we should call it out and say, hey, I'm feeling shame, can you help me? If we're on the receiving end of that request for help, what do we do about that? Yeah, so that's step three, good question. When we're calling out for help, it's really great if our partner knows this same story and they can help us replace it. So we're gonna tell ourselves this. It's nice to also have some external input as well. So if they can tell us the same thing or some version of that, that's going to help to cement it a little bit. Did you get a pen out of the drawer? Okay, I'm going to take that down. And yeah, when do you are still, you're unmuted. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first, like, first thing, call it out. Hey, I need help. And then you're immediately changing your story. And then hopefully your partner is there helping you support the story. You can tell them like, okay, I'm feeling inadequate as a provider again because you want me to get a second job and I don't feel like that will help and I feel like it'll distract me and also I don't feel like I can go network. So that's why I feel unmanly. And she can say, you know what? I believe in you and you can learn and you can get better and we can work on this together. You know, it was interesting. We were at Costco this week and I was walking down the aisle, having some, some buckets of wheat. And I was seized with this sense of like, oh no. And I paused and I was like, oh, what's going on emotions? What, what is happening with you? And I realized I had a story of scarcity in my head. And maybe because it's a, it's a holiday on Monday, maybe it's just something in the air. But I had so many clients like, 10 people this week say, hey, we're going to put therapy on hold for a bit, or hey, we're going on vacation, or hey, um, we can't afford to do this every week anymore, or you know what, I'm feeling good. I think it's time to cut back. Like 10 people did that. So my hours dropped by 10 in one week, and I was like, oh no, what if this is the beginning of the end? This is how we die in the poorhouse. I will never have any more clients ever again. And I immediately called out to Heidi, like, Heidi, help. I feel like I'm not doing a good job and everything's falling apart. Will you talk to me, please? And, and I was like, please tell my heart, tell my heart. And she's, she's short. She walked up to me and she's like, it's going to be okay. We're fine. We've got savings. You'll get new clients. I was like, okay. Okay, good. It's a measure of progress, though, to consider that I didn't have as much of the provider fare come in anymore. It was just well, maybe there's not as many clients right now as would be ideal. I guess we better try some actual advertising since we've just done word of mouth so far and that's been working. <laughs> maybe we could advertise. Okay. Well, if advertising doesn't work, maybe then I'll worry. But I'm a good provider and we'll advertise and things will be fine. But having that story of hope changed everything. I was like, all right, we can continue to spend money in Costco now. We're going to be okay. So I'd like to have us uh, practice that declaration one more time. We've all got it written down now, right? Yes. So I'm going to put this up on the board. 
and let's all unmute ourselves and let's say it together. And this time I want us to say it together with passion and intensity and enthusiasm. And I want to make the bowels of the very internet quake with the strength of our conviction as we say this. Are we ready? All right, everyone unmute. So here we go. I may not be may very, not be capable, very capable, capable or lovable. lovable. I'm still yes, enough. I'm still enough. My, my work has nothing to do with my performance. performance. People, People like, like me, me. No, I'm, no, no, I'm flawed. No, I'm flawed. All right, we can do a little better, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you off this easy this time. So what's step four then? We've, we've like recognized there's a shame. We've called out for help. We've changed our story. We've had our partner help us with our story. Remember, we're, we're fighting shame. We're going to replace it with guilt, which says, hey, maybe you need to improve something. Maybe you messed up. So then we commit to working on the problem. We take responsibility for it. Now, taking responsibility for a problem isn't just saying, okay, I'll work on this. We need to be serious about it. We need to actually commit to doing so. And that means remembering that it's a problem in the first place. So one of the best things I have found is phone reminders. I love using Google Calendar. Just pop up and tell me what to work on. Every Wednesday, I have a reminder pop up that says, hey, what kind of stories are you telling yourself about life? Like, let's check in with, with work and with home and your relationships and well, how do you feel about them? You're getting kind of negative, you're feeling hopeless, or do you feel powerful and confident like you're moving forward? It gives me an opportunity to work on being just more positive in general. And when those pop up, I mean, when we can see them, then we quickly dismiss them or click done. But if we take a minute to really ponder it in our heart and to visualize and rehearse, like, okay, the next time I have some clients like not come back for a while or drop out. I'm going to say like, that's fine. This is part of the ebb and flow. It's been this way since the very beginning. And every summer there's always a drop. And I always forget there's a drop at the beginning of summer. It always picks back up later. So I can just think of this as like, yay, some vacation time for me. How fun is that? One of the things I've struggled with is dates. Planning dates has been scary. I have these false beliefs that the dates I take my wife on have to be unique every single time. And I've got to keep this up for what, 40 years of marriage. Like I have to do something unique constantly. It's just overwhelming. And so I completely shut down and I'm like, okay, we've spent a lot of time together. We don't need to go on dates. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, she's come to me and said, Hey, it makes me feel special when you take me on dates. And I don't feel so special when you go. So I put the reminder on my phone. And like every three weeks it pops up to take your idea on a date. And I recognized, you know, that's it's not the full equation there because I would just go, oh, dear, ah, geez, I'm, I'm not good at this. I'm going to wipe it away. And so part of taking responsibility for this was figuring out what was stopping me? What did I need to change? Well, what's the fear? It has to be unique. Is that true? No. And I've talked to her before about this and she's told me in my eyeballs, face to face multiple times, I just want to do something. I don't care if it's the same thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you don't, you don't mean that though. It has to be something special. <laughs> so I recognize there's this problem. And then I, I remind myself, okay, it can be something repetitive. It's fine. And you know what? We're good at figuring stuff out. Because guess what? We have the internet. And all I have to do is go like, what's happening, Utah.com or whatever it is. And I look through it. I find, oh, look. You can go feed baby animals up at the farm in Salt Lake. Cool. Let's go feed a goat a bottle. Not as awesome as I thought it would be. Maybe we should have chosen like the lambs instead. I don't know. But we went on a date. I planned and executed a successful date and we drank raw milk and none of us threw up. So it was a good day and we all win. So take your responsibility, set up the reminder in your phone, make a commitment in your heart that you're going to do it, and then sit and take the time to ponder and visualize it. Everybody gonna do that? I want you all to hold up your pinky finger and turn to the person next to you and interlock pinkies. You're a pinky promising, you're gonna work on this. And if you're by yourself, you just grab your own pinky and you promise to yourself, we're gonna do this, we're dedicated. 
Now, does this sound complicated? Just recognize, ugh, call out for help, change the story, have them help you, commit to do something about it. That's not complicated. Will it take work? Sure. But you totally got this. Any questions at this point? So why can I say that it's a lie? The shame is a lie that we're not worthless, <laughs> even though we have limitations. Because again, everybody struggles with it. Everyone makes mistakes. Everyone screws up. And the most confident people you know are probably just pretending to be confident. It takes a long time and a lot of work and a lot of intention to become truly confident. But you can tell the ones who aren't just pretending because they're willing to admit the problem and they're not doing it in a way that's like, <laughs> please don't reject me. I'll tell you about all my problems so that, so that you'll give me comfort and consolation. The people who are confident are not born that way. They're not magically better. It's not like you walk into the, the baby ward in the hospital and you're like, oh, that one's a confident person and that one's not a confident person. That's not how it works. Confidence is simply a skill. And the people who are confident have just accepted that it's okay to be flawed. It's okay not to be perfect. It's a skill. It starts with accepting yourself as you are, flaws and all. So not good enough how you are, too bad. You just have to accept that. And if you don't accept your flaws now, then you're never going to change. I can promise you that it slows down your progress to a snail's pace and it might actually stop it completely. I'm not sure yet. I don't think I've lived long enough to see the evidence, but I do know beating myself up until I improved didn't really work. For some people to get better and better at willpower and white knuckling it, but it is too heavy a burden to walk around feeling like you're not good enough for the rest of your life. You weren't meant to live that way. No one was and it's a low quality way. Better to just accept that it's okay to have the flaws and to love yourself anyway. And when you do, you are going to see your growth explode and change. And you're going to look back and go, holy cow, I'm really moving forward now. This is amazing. And to do that requires that we are constantly compassionate with ourselves. There are times I screw up and I go, it's okay, Kenneth, you messed up. <laughs> it's all right. I'm going to give myself a pat, a good rub. I'm like, everybody screws up. This is okay. We're going to make mistakes. We talk to ourselves with kindness and compassion. And when we do that with ourselves, we're then able to do it to other people. And it matters more because they feel it more because they recognize we're not having a double standard here. So I'd like you to get your notes again. And I'd like to take a couple minutes to find your shame points. What are the things that you struggle with? What are the specifics? Um, and I see we've got some questions in the chat box. Let me address this real quick. What if we feel shame for asking for help with shame? Yeah, that's pretty normal. <laughs> Many people do. They just call it out like, I have shame. And I feel ashamed for having shame and asking for help with shame. But everybody needs help with shame. And so, man, I would just say practice that. All the people who love you who are really on your team, like, hey, I need some help. I struggle with admitting we're asking for help with my shame. Can you tell me why it's actually okay that I ask for help with this? normal thing. So there's there's one. We've already found one. But why don't you make a list in your notes? Where are the areas that really hurt? For me, it was being a good enough provider. I used to have a lot of religious perfectionism when I was younger. I needed to be more righteous. You might feel like you're 
not selfless enough. Find your areas that need the work. So while people are thinking about their um, shame points, uh, I have another question. What if you feel fairly confident and somebody comes to you and asks for help with their shame, but you're not sure what they need? So you're not sure how to help them with their shame, what do you do then? If somebody comes to you and says, I'm having this shameful feeling about X, um, but you've never had that feeling or that experience, then how do you know what to say to them that will be, um, that will be helpful to them? First, we wanna start with finding what the lie is because we know they're tying something to their worth and their value. So they can tell you like, oh, well, this, this is the reason. Then you help them find the truth and change that story. Like, oh, so you feel like you're not good enough because you got a 23 on the ACT. Okay, so what do you need to do to feel like you're good enough? Oh, high academic achievement, okay. That's one that a lot of people are struggling with right now. A lot of teenagers are being crippled by thoughts of college, thinking their entire future rides on this grade because if they fail this test, they don't get into college. And I know people who have dropped out of school completely who are ridiculously capable and competent because of that. So please ease up on your kids. Let them get some B's and C's. So find the lie and then help them see the truth and remind them that you love them even in their imperfect state. And that's one of the best things you can do. Just continue to pour on the love. Let them know that they're accepted as they are. So as you look at your list, you look at what needs to be changed, like is there some addiction going on? Do you feel like you're a mean person? Do you feel like you're a selfish person or a lazy person? First of all, let's now find the lie in those. Are you selfish? Well, maybe everyone's selfish sometimes. Everyone needs to be self-interested to a certain point. We have needs that we need to take care of and they need to come first usually because if we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of other people. We feel like we're lazy. Mm, eh, no, not really. We're probably just feeling a lot of anxiety about the thing. Are we mean, mean person? No, we're probably a person that lashes out when we hurt. That's pretty normal. Are we addicted to something? You know, so maybe we're trying to distract ourselves from our feelings of shame with some other substance, some other activity. Let's accept the truth that these things don't define us. And then make the commitment. All right, what do I do with this now? I have these problems but I can accept myself. And accepting yourself doesn't mean accepting your problems. A lot of people say like, well, no, I'm, I'm not good enough as I am. I can't, I can't accept me because that means accepting my problems. No, accepting yourself means going like, I'm worthy of feeling okay right now. I don't have to like wait until I get to some level of perfection before I give myself a sense of like love and compassion. No, you're worthy of that now. That's what it means to accept yourself. Right now in my flawed condition, I deserve compassion. I deserve some recognition, some gratitude, some honor, some respect. And I recognize I have problems and I don't want to stick around forever. So loving and accepting myself, that's the fuel that drives me forward to then have the energy to work on the problems because there's nothing in the tank. If you fill that up with self-loathing, you're not going to get anywhere. So we let go of that and go, I love myself and that's why I wanna change because I deserve to have a great life. I deserve to feel good and fix my problem. I'm worth it. And I'm gonna show myself I'm worth it by taking really good care of myself. So there's gonna be times in the future, in the next week, in the next day, 
when you get criticized, when somebody points out something that you know you could have done better on, or you think you could have done better on, but honestly, this is probably the best you can do right now, and that's also something you should accept. But probably going to be your partner. They're just going to mention something like a massage coupon that you haven't used, and you're going to go, oh, no, I'm terrible with my management. I'm terrible with running my life. And you have the choice to go down the shame path or to react with guilt and say, oh, I did do this thing, and it's okay. When anybody, including your partner, brings up criticism, and maybe they do it in an aggressive way, maybe they do it in a way that's not so nice, tell yourself that, you know what, I will take the truth at any cost. I don't care where it comes from. I don't care if it's my worst enemy. If they say something true, if there's something in me that needs to change, then I will take that. And I can say to them, I appreciate you bringing that to my attention. Thank you. The whole time in your head, you're going, my mistakes don't define me. I can still love and be nice to myself in this moment. <sighs> Give myself a hug, pat on the back. I'm fine. They saw me. They saw my nakedness. They have seen my shame. They have seen that I am not as good as I wish I was. I stand before them with nothing to hide. And that's what makes me powerful because I'm willing to own it. I'm, I'm okay with it being shown because my mistakes don't define me. There was one night I went for a walk with my wife. We were sitting on the curb watching the sunset and he brought up my napkins. And I started putting this into practice and I said to myself, you know what? Even if I think I deserve to be punished, even if I think I deserve to be punished by making myself feel like crap, if I punish myself, I will spiral and she will feel alone. And even if I think I deserve it, I know my wife doesn't. It's going to hurt her. So for her sake, I won't. Because when we choose to hurt ourselves, we disconnect from our loved ones, and that hurts them. So if the selfish word is a trigger for you, let's, let's leverage that a little bit. Falling into shame is one of the most selfish things you can do. How's that? If you really want to be selfless and care for other people, you must start with yourself. And it's one of the best gifts that you can give them. If you can love and forgive yourself. You stay connected to them, and then you can help them with their stuff. I hope everybody heard that. The best way to help somebody else is to start with yourself. And when we punish us, we end up punishing the people around us, even though we're not trying to. So if you think you deserve punishment, you have to beat yourself up, just know that you're not just hurting you. We're all connected. You can't take your lumps in private like that and not affect other people. And some of you might be thinking, oh, no, no, I just do this on the lawn. It's fine. You're not showing up in your life the way you could be. You're not showing up with the awareness and the compassion and the energy that you could for other people. You're missing needs. You're missing things you could do for them. And even if you feel like, no, no, I see all their needs and I'm meeting them, and just not doing it on the level you could be. So to love them, start with you first. What do we talk about tonight? We talk about how shame is feeling worthless and thinking it needs to be punished. We talked about how guilt is saying, oh no, like I'm not the problem. The problem is the problem. This is separate from me. And I need to take responsibility. And when shame comes up, we're going to want to spiral. But instead, instead of spiraling, we're just going to say, oh, um, no, I have to take responsibility for this. And we're going to go through the, the list. We're going to ask for help if we need it. Call it out. Hey, I'm starting to feel some shame. Can you help me with this? You change your story. They help you to reinforce the story. You take responsibility to do something about it. And you'll remind yourself, I may not be very capable or lovable, but I'm still enough. My worth has nothing to do with my performance. People still like me, even though I'm flawed. And you're going to be amazed 
at the change this makes and how fast this goes. Because if you pour on the self-compassion, you're gonna be putting rocket fuel in your tank and you probably never, never tasted anything like that before if you've been stuck in shame. You're gonna level yourself up to where you feel secure. You're gonna be able to take criticism like right to your face. People can just eviscerate you and you'll be like, okay, yep, it still stings a little bit, but you're gonna feel okay about it because you know it doesn't have anything to do with you. You're gonna understand in your gut that the opinions of other people don't change your value, yours or theirs. Your bad opinion of yourself doesn't change your value and neither do other people's. When, when you are in this state of self-compassion, you're not gonna be reactive. You're gonna be able to really connect with people and listen. And you'll know that criticism can only make you better. And you're also gonna recognize that criticism isn't really the best way to help people change. And because you've been treating yourself with love and compassion, you're going to be able to treat others with love and compassion. With the beam out of your own eye, you're going to see clearly how to love other people into growing. And it's gonna be amazing. I'm excited for how you're going to change. I'm excited to hear about it too. So shoot me an email. When you have an experience with this or a struggle, I'm interested to hear and I'm willing to help. I think we have a question. Yeah, yes. I have a question. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm thinking about this and it seems like if you, if a person gets to this point of um, getting past shame and being more confident, that it could trigger additional shame in the people around them. Like, I just worry about that. <laughs> it's true. I saw a... <laughs> A quote the other day from Denzel Washington, something like, uh, sometimes the spirit in you will trigger the demons in other people. Um, let me look at a quote really quick. Okay, this is from Marianne Williamson. She said, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. And it's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And so, yeah, some people will take it wrong. And people who are stuck in shame will see genuine confidence as pride and ego and bravado. And the best way to show them that it's something different is to keep shining. Because when we shine, when we love us, we love them too. Even when they make it harder to love them. So it will set some people off. But what are we gonna do? Shrink back and hide? Not gonna help anybody. We just need to continue to love and that love will eventually melt like an ice cube in the sun. I think too that when we get to the point where we do love ourselves more or we're more content or happier than um, and practicing that compassion for ourselves, it helps us to feel that compassion for other people. And that shows and how we treat them and how we talk to them and how we compliment them. Um, so that when we're changing, it helps us to give positive feedback to build them up more, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. When they lash out, we can respond with love. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any final questions before we end? It can be on anything we've talked about tonight or anything in general. Uh, related question. <laughs> mm -hmm. So maybe maybe that was the answer that 
being able to overcome compassion or sorry, overcome <laughs> becoming more compassionate to ourselves can help with others. But I was wondering if you have any other specific suggestions for helping someone else that is feeling shamed. When we know more about how their shame is, we can preemptively deal with it. I mean, if we know they have performance problems, if a kid comes home from school with an A minus and they're inconsolable, like some I've seen, you can immediately just go to like, hey, grades don't define you. It's okay to get an A minus. It's okay to get a D minus sometimes. It's okay to mess up and be imperfect. Knowing what hurts them, knowing what they struggle with, gives us the opportunity to get out ahead of it. And not even in the times too, not just in the times when they're hurting, but normal times throughout the day, we can pepper them with declarations. We seem like, hey, you know what? I can tell that you work really hard. That's awesome. You do a good job. You try, and that matters. We can help to change their story with outside compliments. And we will learn how to do that most effectively when we do it on ourselves, because we are the template. If we want to share water from the well, we need to make sure there's something in the well. And the best thing we can do is to begin with ourselves. Does that answer the question? Yes, that, that helped a ton. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, so let's go out there and kick some shame right in the butt. <laughs>